Uh, so welcome to the CDY initiative seminars. Uh, the topic of today's talk is high energy processes and AGN uh, by Paolo Coppi. It, this is part of the series of talks that we have been uh, running, focusing on active galaxies and extragalactic sources. And for the next several weeks until about the middle of June, we'll cover topics on AGN phenomenology, observations and theory. And, and we hope that you can continue to participate in these uh, lectures. Uh, so Paolo is uh, currently a professor of astronomy at Yale University. He's been at Yale for a while, since about 1994. Uh, Paolo did his undergraduate at Harvard. He did his PhD at Caltech, uh, working with uh, Roger Blanford. And then he was a research scientist and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago. So Paolo, Paolo's expertise covers several areas in high energy astrophysics. Uh, he's worked on plasma astrophysics, topics in particle astrophysics. He's interested in large area multi-wavelength surveys, um, a study of a diverse set of sources, including active galactic nuclei, uh, galactic X-ray binaries, physics of compact objects, primordial star formation, supermassive black hole formation and mergers. Paolo has been author of several high impact papers, and some of which um, I'm just going to mention a couple that uh, I've found extremely interesting. And these include the reaction rates and energy distributions for elementary processes and relativistic plasmas, the study of cascading emission, uh, formation of pair halos, high energy processes and accreting black holes, just to name a few. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of awards. Paolo has received several including uh, the Yale Senior Faculty Fellowship. Uh, he's received the GILA Visiting Fellowship. He was a Compton Camaray Observatory Fellow and also a Robert Millikan Graduate Fellow. And I also finally wanted to mention that Paolo Paolo is one of the co-founders of the CDY initiative that we've been now running for about two years, I think, one and a half years. Uh, so it's with great pleasure that we welcome Paolo, uh, Paolo Coppi for today's talk high energy processes in AGN. Paolo, do you want to share your screen? I'm Absolutely. just going to ask people, if you're not speaking, please please remember to mute your microphone. All right, let's see, screen two happens here. OK, Can, does it look OK, Rashmi? Yeah, it looks, uh, looks great. Thank you. OK, and you can hear me? OK. Yeah. All right. Great. So I guess today I'm going to continue what Luigi Costamante started last time, walking through uh, you through what happens at AGN. The talk is mostly going to be more phenomenological than going into theory and equations, partly because uh, the acceleration mechanisms uh, at work have already been talked about a bit in much more detail uh, by other people earlier in the year. Um, also, I'm going to note up front that there are lots of experts on various things I'm going to fly through, so I'm not going to be able to do justice to a lot of it. Uh, apologies in advance, and uh, if you have questions, that's something that we could bring up in the discussion section uh, session uh, afterwards. So, and part of the talk is also ideas to cover lots of different things and in the hope of inspiring people, and maybe we can spin off a mini workshop or something in the future to go address some of these things in, in more detail. Um, the first uh, slide I wanted to start with uh, on purpose has almost no AGN on it. And the reason for that is that I think there's a lot to learn from other objects that accelerate uh, uh, high energy particles, um, in particular supernova remnants, um, that they're somewhat different regimes. But if I hadn't told you what this was and you just saw two humps, if you looked at the top of Luigi Costamante, you might have been uh, mistaken this for a blazer, right? <laughs> With uh, this is a synchrotron component and this is the inverse Compton component. Okay. Um, so uh, similar things may, or may be at work or may not, but um, that's part of the reason why we have this interdisciplinary kind of institute to see what we can learn from different things. Um, the other thing is I'm going to show you, this is a, a picture of Cygnus X1, okay, and really what I'm talking about is a stellar mass black hole if my key works, let's see, yep, okay, uh, with a, a black hole and a, a Christian disk, a corona, and a jet, okay, not a very relativistic one in the case of Cygnus X1. But uh, nonetheless, it's the same basic ingredients we have a, with an active galactic nucleus, except for the, uh, the inflow of the gas is not coming from a companion, but a bunch of gas sitting near the center of the nucleus, perhaps brought in uh, from a recent uh, merger of two galaxies. Okay, but otherwise, 
um, a lot has been made. You can find lots of plots in the literature showing how uh, physics, for example, the ratio of the X-ray luminosity or the coronal luminosity to the overall bolometric luminosity of the system scales with uh, Eddington accretion rate. And people put black, uh, stellar mass, tensilar mass black holes in the same plot as active, galactic, active galactic nuclei with 10 to the 9 solar mass black holes. So um, GR in principle is sort of scale free, uh, or <clears throat> okay, as long as you have GM over R the same, and you measure everything in short short radii. In principle, things kind of look the same. In practice, uh, you have different physics going on a bit, uh, like the uh, things, uh, the temperature of the accretion disk scales as the inner edge as mass to the one quarter, which is a weak dependence, but between 10 solar masses and 10 to the nine solar masses, we have 10 to the eight factor there. So even a quarter of that is a factor of 100, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the eight to the quarter is a factor of 100. And so that some of the cooling physics and things actually changes. But nonetheless, there are uh, lots of similarities. And a relevance to what uh, we're going to talk about now is uh, stellar mass black holes of discrete states where the accretion disk goes all the way in. That's called a soft state. And a uh, hard state where the accretion disk doesn't seem to go all the way in and there's a corona at the center. And the jets only appear during the hard state. Okay. The advantages of uh, studying uh, stellar mass black holes is they, in a graduate student lifetime, for example, they may go through several cycles, accretion cycles, and things like that. Instead, in active galactic nuclei, the natural time scales, viscous time scales, everything are hundreds to hundreds of thousands of years. They're not supposed to do things on a graduate school uh, lifetime, but in, in fact, they do. Okay, but you can uh, see what's happening in a sort of much faster way. Also, um, some of these systems are much closer to us, and when you figure out what you see in a detector, you get much better uh, photon statistics from these guys than AGN. So it's useful to see what lessons we can learn from these. And in general, um, one of the things that happened in the early 90s was, uh, and I left out the credit for this, was people realized or made the recognition that here's a quasar, okay, age active galactic nucleus, and we have microquasars, which are these stellar mass black hole systems in our galaxy, and also gamma ray bursts, the collapser variety, with a black hole at the center, probably has a, has a relativistic jet too, okay, which can make afterglows and things like that. And these, at some level, are sort of the same system. And what's happened is that some of the people working on these and these reinvented what people did here. And so it's good to have communication between all these three communities, I think. Okay, and there's been some reinventing of the wheel, but that's good. We should get together. So um, the main differences between microquasars are that we're dealing with a stellar mass black hole versus a 10 to the 8 to the 9 solar mass black hole in an active galactic nucleus, um, especially the ones that uh, make objects like Markarian uh, 501. And here we're probably dealing with another stellar mass black hole. And the environment is important, okay? There's an accretion disk, but not much else. It's relatively clean, the system, okay? And AGN is not clean. There's lots of gas coming in, uh, and there's a molecular torus all the way out to kiloparsec. Um, so there's lots of stuff, and the radiation field is very, very strong inside here. There's something called a broadline region where the ionizing radiation from the accretion disk in the ultraviolet it gets absorbed by a gas and re-radiated, and it's moving fast at tenth of the speed of light sometimes, and uh, maybe, sorry, hundredth of the speed of light. And uh, so uh, you get broad Doppler broad uh, emission lines, okay? And in this case, your black hole is sitting in the center of a star that's dying, so uh, it's pretty... Uh, different, but nonetheless, there's physics, so that's important. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is actually not what you expected. Okay, <clears throat> um, and I'm going to focus on X-ray binary for a second. And uh, well, what I wanted to point out is, first, of all, I'm going to talk about what kind of um, energy coverage you need to constrain what's going on, but also um, the point out that where could gamma rays come from from an active galactic nucleus? Where people first thought they came from was actually from the accretion disk itself and the environment around it. And there's evidence uh, for that, okay? Um, just uh, to show you why it's important to have multi-wavelength broadband observations, just even for studying uh, the emission from accretion disk or the corona, the near environment uh, near the black hole, say up to 100 short shield radii. Um, this is the early days, okay? Um, observations, for example, using a Chandra X-ray satellite or something um, of Cygnus X1, so a mass black hole, and there was a so-called high soft state. The luminosity is high, and the spectrum is very soft. All the power is sitting at uh, kV. Okay, in this case, the spectrum is hard. The peak is somewhere over here, and it's low, the luminosity. So this is a soft high state and the low hard state. 
and uh, everybody knows that the luminosity is lower, okay? And the only escape uh, route from that statement that I just made is, well, we don't actually know where the peak is, but everybody knows that, you know, Chandra is the all, be all of all satellites, so clearly the peak is right here. So we don't have to worry about bolometric corrections. So what actually happens is this, where's the peak? Oh my God, it came all the way out to like 200 kV. So, and when you actually compute the bolometric luminosity of the low hard state and the soft hard state, they only differ by less than a factor of two. So the lesson taken from this and also from pulsar observations where like the radio is irrelevant and all the pu most pulsar luminosity comes out of the gamma rays, you better be observing where the energy is coming out and you better be able to uh, uh, measure the curvature of the spectrum where it is because curvature is what tells you uh, physics and length scales and cooling time scales and things like that. If you only have a snippet, just a little power law, any uh, theorist worth their salt can fit that. Okay, so you want to look for a break. So you need broad energy coverage over here. And Luigi showed us that blazars have emission all the way down to radio, going up to TV energy. So we really need to cover all of those uh, energy ranges. And that's a pain in the neck. And in the past, um, it was in the presence of an eminent British astronomer who proclaimed, oh my God, not yet another multi-wavelength blazer proposal. Okay, because as Luigi said, we've collected lots of data, but we haven't fully synthesized it yet. But nonetheless, um, we're getting there. Uh, and uh, in particular, an instrument that we definitely need is something that operates in the MBV range, which we'll see in a second. Okay, so um, back to stellar mass black holes. Um, there is indeed high energy emission, okay? And uh, this is same spectrum showing, this is data points from Comtel, okay? That are not exactly simultaneous, but it didn't seem to be doing much. That time that there's emission detected out to two or three uh, TV, even in the hard state, and there's a emission again going out to not TV, several MeV. Okay, and um, some of this emission could be from an extended jet. Sorry, I misspelled that, um, but a lot of it probably is also from the corona, which some people call the base of the jet. All right, and Cygnus X1 is not really a microquasar. It does have a jet-like feature in radio, but it's never that powerful and has no huge outbursts that we've seen to date like Cygnus X3 or GRS 1915, which shoot out huge blobs, okay? And the key thing here is there is a recent observational result that it, uh, stacks up a whole bunch of Fermi data and uh, Cygnus X1 is actually detected all the way out to, this is uh, GV basically. So several, several GV, the emission continues. So we've got relativistic particles over there. And you can fit this spectrum using something called a hybrid model um, where you, most of the power is going into heating your electrons. It's making a sort of thermal bath. It doesn't really have to be thermal as long as the mean energy of most of the particles is moderately as non-relativistic like Lorentz factor one to two, sorry, Lorentz factor order two. And, and if you, in that case, if you do repeated scattering, you'll have something that looks like in uh, thermal compensation spectrum, but there'll be a tail. All right, and in this case, this extended emission seems to come mo mostly um, during the uh, hard state, okay? So the question is, does the same thing happen in AGN? And we don't know, why? Because uh, we have no detector that really can see this level of emission right now. In the future, I hope we can do something about that, okay? Uh, a curiosity is, if you take uh, the gamma ray emission of 3273, which was the only source detected by COSB and assume that all AGN quasars emit at that level, you produce the level of the extragalactic background. So if we go a bit lower uh, in the, than that, let's say, uh, and include more objects and some lower luminosity objects, it, it's quite possible that um, AGN emit at, at this kind of relative level compared to the peak of the emission. So that's something to worry about. Also, um, in terms of neutrinos and things like that, you have hot protons floating around at the center. They may not be emitting radio, uh, uh, um, relatively, okay, but they can smash into each other and make nuclear emission lines. Their energies are not TVs, but sort of GVs, so they won't produce ice cube neutrinos, but um, the accretion disk and the immediate environments could be neutrino sources also, all right? And this just shows you if we had a better detector, like Astro-H, which unfortunately, unfortunately is not with us, we could have nailed the shape in this critical region, all right? So what about um, now? going back to what uh, you thought you were going to hear about, which is jets, okay? The, the, uh, one of the amazing features of um, 
active galactic nuclei is that 10% of them have these things called powerful radio jets, where uh, there, if you look really closely, there's a little line of radio emission in this case, and, and, and then it smashes into uh, so-called radio lobes, which we've heard about. Um, and uh, something that's relevant and here, which was known since the early uh, 50s, observations by Burbage and others, is uh, you can add up the radio emission. You can see that it's polarized. It's probably synchrotron emission. You can make the so-called equipartition argument uh, and add together the total amount of energy in the magnetic field plus the kinetic energy of the particles, gamma mc squared, that are doing the radiation. And that's a minimum, OK? Uh, B squared over A pi plus the kinetic energy. And that energy turned out to be uh, like 10 to the 60 plus 63 ergs, a huge amount of energy. So um, these guys are extremely powerful. And what could have produced it? It's symmetric. And there's a line going all the way back to the center. The only thing we've been able to think is a black hole produced it and shot stuff out, OK? So we're dealing with extreme, uh, very large energetics, OK? And uh, just in case for those who thought about it too much, one of the features, especially of these so-called FR2, FR Fanarov Valley 2 jets, is that the line going to the center, the jet, okay, very narrow pencil beam open angle of a, a few degrees, okay, on the sky is often one-sided, at least on small scales. That's an indication that this jet is relativistic, sometimes highly relativistic. Um, using VLBI, the latest VLBA array, uh, we can see motions on the sky that are superluminal and have uh, inferred apparent. Uh, superlumen means going faster than the speed of light. It's a relativistic trick, okay? Um, but it means that the Doppler factors could be as high as 30, okay, or more, 40, okay? And, um, and this part is actually uh, pointed towards you, okay? And so the emission is Doppler boosted uh, in luminosity. On the other side, you miss the counter jet because it's pointed away from you, the relativistic motion's away from you, and um, you don't see it until the jet smashes into something, in this case, maybe an intercluster medium, intracluster medium, and the jet dies and becomes non-relativistic. And now the particles are emitting isotropically in your frame because they basically slowed down and stopped. OK, uh, that's a common uh, feature. So in terms of what we've talked about beforehand, the first few lectures about ultra energy cosmic rays, uh, these are great sites. Andrew Taylor and, and Tony Bell talked about that these are possible sites of ultra energy cosmic ray acceleration. And this clearly extended gamma ray emission could come from these. And perhaps in Centaurus A, we have seen extended Fermi emission. So that's another site of uh, particle acceleration. I'm not going to talk more about that because it's been uh, addressed uh, somewhat. OK. Um, as uh, Luigi said, um, this is the Fanarov Riley 2 class of objects. When you look at um, radio sources, OK, on the sky, the ones that are not pointed straight at you, which are blazers, which we're going to talk about more in a second. Um, you generically see two patterns as a function of total jet power. One, super powerful uh, sources like this that are relativistic one-sided jets, and objects like that, FR1, OK, where the jet comes out but quickly dies. And if you model it, you can do a hydro simulation, and you, have, you put in a transonic flow, starts out with a Lorentz factor of a few, and then dies. And that explains what's going on uh, pretty well, all right? And the jet is um, not symmetric in terms of luminosity, if you can see down here. Let's see. Yeah. OK, it's brighter on one side. So it's moderately relativistic. That's what explains it. And it, and it dies out, OK? So um, the HBL high peaked blazars that Luigi talked about tend to live in these systems over here, which are much lower power than these typically and do not have strong radiation environments in the center. And, and a possible example of these that sits maybe somewhere in between these is our own nearest neighbor giant black hole AGN, M87, the one that's studied by um, the Event Horizon Telescope. OK. Um, and I consider it a bit of a Rosetta Stone. It's not a blazar because it's not pointed straight at us. It's misaligned by maybe 20-ish, 30 degrees. OK. But nonetheless, it's clearly got a relativistic jet uh, shooting down. And you may have seen pictures where you can actually track the motion of some of these so-called knots, OK? And um, they actually move superluminally, OK? And down here, this is HST1, the famous knot. And here, you can see things that are kiloparsec moving on the sky with apparent speeds of V over C of order 6, OK? So this jet, that's only possible if this jet is relativistic all the way down here. So 
Um, that's evidence that maybe jets are more complicated than we thought. Even though I told you by down here, the luminosity ratios look pretty similar, the same. Okay, so the jet should have been transonic and slowed down. Not, it's not relativistic anymore. That's, it's more complicated than that. So one of the themes, which I'm going to go th uh, to through fast, is jet sub structure. Maybe there's a slower layer. Okay, uh, stuff is moving slower on the outside. And inside, there could be a fast so-called spine which uh, remains relativistic all the way. So one of the questions is, um, yeah, what is the Doppler factor? What's the actual velocity uh, flow look like? All right. Um, one of the th interesting things about M87, it's very nearby. We can actually resolve X-ray emission and watch it come and go. And uh, different spots light up. At a kiloparsec, HST1, um, you can see strong X-ray emission. Um, in other objects, this X-ray emission uh, we can't measure the polarization yet. That may come with the XB satellite, but um, radiation and the ultraviolet can be looked at by HST and it is polarized. That suggests that this could actually be synchrotron emission. In that case, um, we we're probably dealing with TeV electrons when you come through. So the jet, besides radial lobes, inside down here, can, it's capable of accelerating particles up to TeV energies probably. All right, and one more example of this, um, you can use the Spitzer telescope <clears throat> in map out. In this case, it's a jet of 373 and make nice pictures. And again, this is Chandra. You can see there's X-ray emission. And then down here, there's uh, infrared emission from Spitzer. The SED spectral energy distribution looks like this. This is a new F new plot. So the peak tells you where the energy is coming out. And there are two components, all right? Um, and here are the various knots, all right, that come and go. This one in particular, um, the optical again is polarized. And if you ask yourself, um, if this emission down here is polarized, um, what, can, what can it be produced by? If it were uh, one of the competing models is called the CMV bulk up upscattering, that does not produce strong polarization in most uh, cases. So assuming this is synchrotron, you can extend it up and you would have predicted Fermi emission, which probably is not seen, but not very strong. So uh, extended jet emission is a possible target for CTA and a super Fermi, okay? Or when you integrate with lots of time. So there is there's a possibility for van der Heijen emission all the way down the jet in principle. All right, so let's go to some models with apologies to Francis Halsen who's on the talk. Here's a simple particle physicist view. Yep, there's a black hole, there's a beam and a beam dump. There are some targets, the radiation that astronomers will tell you and that's where we get neutrinos and, and things like that. In real life, it's a little bit more complicated. So let's go into uh, some of the details which have been alluded to in the past, all right? There are two main models and I'm gonna go through this uh, multiple times um, for what's going on is there's a black hole, there's our beam or whatever it is, um, a multiple acceleration regions. Uh, these could be, for example, shocks inside the jet um, what could be happening, as we'll see an example later, is the central engine, to use gamma ray burst language, is pulsing in, and uh, sending an outflow. And as the source pulses, um, some of the inner stuff emitted down here may be moving slightly faster, and it catches up to material that's moving slowly. And you can have a so-called internal shock, and you get energy generation particle acceleration. Okay, And if you have electrons, um, what happens in... Uh, especially in the flat spectrum radio quasars. What makes something a quasar if it is, is if it has strong broad emission lines. That means there's a lot of ionizing radiation coming out from the accretion disk and it's ionizing the surrounding medium and making these so-called broad lines. Um, that means there are a lot of photons in the environment. An object like M87 in contrast has no strong ionizing radiation source at the center. And if you look at HST, you can see a very little teeny but extremely weak point source there. So um, it's a much cleaner environment than what I've drawn over here. So, but the generic uh, gamma ray blazar um, has a accretion disk, okay, and some magnetic field, which may be very important, okay. Um, and uh, but it has UV and X-ray photons coming directly from the accretion disk, and then you can reprocess these. These, okay. Some of the radiation may be processed further out, where the characteristic temperature drops to infra in the, drops into the infrared, okay. Um, but um, there could also be other things producing infrared uh, radiation like star formation that is um, optically thick. So you can have a bunch of infrared photons out here. 
And these represent target photons that you can interact with. And we're going to go through in a second and go through a slide where we consider the various processes. But basically, you can have your photons interacting with electrons and or positrons and uh, or protons. OK? You can choose. OK, so if it's electrons and positrons, that's the so-called leptonic model. And if it's with the protons, it's the hadronic model. OK? Um, so why does this matter that it's a messy place? All right. Um, a few little considerations is um, that these uh, target photons are great, but imagine a gamma ray propagating through an environment filled with photons. And we're going to derive something called a compactness parameter in a second, which is basically measure the optical depth due to photon-photon pair production. And you'll discover that the broadline region is supposed to be quite very optically thick um, to gamma rays above 20 GeV. And uh, as mentioned by Luigi, and one of the mysteries is why don't we see cutoffs at 20 GeV? Um, <clears throat> OK, if you're in infrared, then the cutoff, the pair production absorption cutoff comes out at around a few TV. OK, um, and another thing that happens is that's important, the intensity of the radiation field. There's a zone of avoidance. Let's say that your jet is made of pairs, which some people like to do, um, and pairs propagate through here. The fact that this region is compact um, all right, means that photon energy density is large enough that um, typically it's enough to decelerate uh, the electrons and positrons. Okay, so if your jet were made of pure electrons and positrons with Lorentz factor more than a few, it would hit a brick wall of photons basically and lose all the radiation, all the energy. So this jet would be dead. All right, but we know from the radio lobes and other sort of uh, calorimetric ways of measuring what's going on that the jet has a huge amount of power at the end. So maybe a lot of power has gone into radiation, uh, gamma rays, but order unity has to have remained in the jet itself. So that's a non-trivial constraint that you have to deal with. So John Kirk once called this the dark energy problem. You have to transport energy from here to here and get it out from Roger Blanc called it the gamma sphere where you get uh, absorption of gamma rays and also usually deceleration of uh, electrons and positrons. So, um, one way to do that is to have your jet be mostly pointing flux magnetic field at this point, dragging a few baryons along, and then we dissipate much later. And once we're in a safe region, and uh, that life can be uh, important, uh, can, life can be safe in that case, and you can get your emission. All right. So, um, so those are some of the things that you have to worry about. Um, all right. So that'd be important. Um, Evidence, maybe that's hopefully will get better that there's something uh, going on and it will complicate things. Another complication is uh, you can look at the broadline region in some of these objects. Okay. Uh, the, in particular, this is a canonical, the brightest object that was seen by Fermi when it turned on was 3C454.3, had a huge uh, flare. All right. And what this is supposed to show you is if you measure the intensity of the uh, broad emission lines, you will see a few that clearly varied by more than two or three sigma. So um, on a time scale of weeks, OK? And that is not supposed to happen. If you stare at other objects, other AGN with big black holes, the emission lines are much more stable uh, than that, OK? Especially for more massive black holes, OK? And then Alan Marsher went and looked at um, which one, CTA 102 and took spectra. And what you see is the spectrum changes radically, OK? There are all sorts of emission lines and things like that that are absent when the object is in a lower state. I apologize for this. I haven't found the right paper where it's published, but it's um, probably uh, pretty certain that something's going on. So what is going on? OK, um, I'll show later. There's something called a Compton mirror. Um, the jet is an incredibly powerful source of photons. It's very beamed. But what if some, some of the ra its radiation is intercepted uh, by the junk around here? All right. Um, I'm showing that the radiation came from the accretion disk and got into the broadline region. But this is a source of UV photons, too, for example, and they can smash into things. So um, perhaps the jet actually messes up the broadline region or ionizes things further out. So um, the jet could be influencing things. And one of the complications that's been talked about so-called Compton mirror is there's matter out here because we see the emission lines. Um, OK, so you can send UV photons from the jet hit something, and they re-radiate, and they can go back and hit the jet again. So there could be some complicated uh, feedback uh, loop here. OK, so um, I call that the disk uh, jet connection, OK, because 
does that exist or not? Okay. And, um, and why is that? Another model for explaining what I've seen with the emission lines is not that the jet illuminated uh, its surrounding region, but simply that there was an accretion disk flare. Okay, there's an accretion event, the accretion disk got more powerful. And if you look at um, X ray binaries, um, oftentimes after an accretion disk flare, the, the, you rip out and send out a blob. Okay, so the central engine shoots something out at the same time that it increases in overall brightness and does the radiation, it sends out ionizing radiation. And what's not apparent from here is which came first, the ionizing radiation or the jet flare, because there was, see these lines here are high, um, this is the gamma ray flux. And so there was a burst of gamma rays, but because of time sample, we don't know if the ionization lines increased before or after the gamma ray flare. That's why we need uh, better studies. So. Um, did the jet cause everything or did the base of the jet, the central engine cause stuff that perturbed the jet? We don't quite know, all right? Um, and a general question that needs to be addressed that's not satisfactory addressed yet is, is when we're talking about what's going on, is the central engine responsible for the variability, variability or the jet itself? And I just wanna remind people, let's see if this works, okay? That jets, uh, when you use computer simulations or observe them in real life, seem to have uh, a helical structure. That means the angle of blobs, perturbances, perturbations moving down the jet um, change their angle relative to your line of sight. That changes the Doppler boost factor. So um, this alone could be responsible for uh, variability that you see. Okay, and um, and in principle, uh, there have been reports of quasi-periodic behavior. This might be what's going on. Either the jet is helical or you have instabilities in the jet, Kelvin Helmholtz, which make the jet have characteristic variations in structure and fluid flow directions um, that could uh, lead to quasi-periodic uh, changes in intensity observed on Earth. In this case, um, the central engine is pretty much doing its same thing, just shooting out a constant flow. It's the structure of the jet that's responsible for the variability. That's all the central engine does perhaps is dictate where the blobs or disturbances exist and then they're just like beads on a wire moving down. So that could be what's going on, all right? Um, so this is what uh, Luigi spent most of his talk on, all right? So I won't repeat that, okay? Just two bumps. This is thought to be synchrotron emission. This is thought to be inverse Compton emission in this case mostly, but it's uh, slightly controversial. Um, one comment I'd like to make is when you have good data, and you'll see more examples of this, does a blazar sequence actually exist? Yes, probably, but it's much weaker than it used to be. It is true probably that the lower luminosity objects are the ones that have highest, the highest energy emission, okay? But you can watch, and this is just, if you, uh, this is an example of a campaign to see how sources evolve with time. You can see sources changing uh, sort of th their peak emission, okay? And uh, we'll see later that some GV sources can become MEV, MEV peak sources, okay? And the peaks can move around over here. So the correlation is not exact. And maybe the explanation for that is um, that there are different regions of the jet that are responsible for the gamma ray emission. And we know in the radio where we have spatial resolution that the jet is definitely inhomogeneous and oops, there are blobs that light up and different blobs in, uh, dominate the total observed emission at different times. So it's a quite complicated structure, okay? And there's no reason why the same should not be true in gamma rays. And maybe some, they sample different radiation, ambient, different, different ambient radiation environments. And so the peaks can come out in different places. Uh, the acceleration and cooling times may vary. And so um, it's not obvious to me at least that uh, the source should sit tightly in one position and it doesn't an in individual source, okay? So, um, and here's just one more uh, yeah, example of this, okay? So this is plotting the spectral index, okay? And at GV energies using Fermi, okay? And if a source has a spectral index harder than two in this direction, that means Fermi observed a spectrum like that. That means the peak is way up at hundreds of GVs or TVs. And these are the HBLs and indeed, um, and this is their power in gamma rays. And what you see is indeed, the HBLs seem to have a hard spectral index. So that fits the Fossati sequence, but you also see that there's a quite a huge scatter, okay? And some HBLs can become soft and have a spectral index in Fermi that's steeper than two, which means it's like that, which means the peak is outside the Fermi range, but on the MEV end. So you can have some HBLs that at least for a while become 
um, uh, become MEV blazars and violate the blazar sequence. So there's a lot more scattered than there used to be. You do see a trend overall. So it's, it's true that there is uh, uh, some kind of statistical uh, uh, sequence. Um, the, the plots I showed beforehand did not have on the axis the total apparent gamma luminosity. And just so you know, um, the values are between 10 to 48, 10 to 49. These are extremely bright. Um, this is like 1,000 times the Eddington luminosity of the source, which is one of the arguments why uh, we think that uh, this radiation must be relativistic, because we don't know where we got this huge level of power from. Um, in terms of jets and structure, one more comment. Um, when people fit these blobs and derive bolometric luminosities from the sources, they assume that the Doppler factor for the emission region is pretty much the same. That doesn't need to be true at all, and that will increase the um, amount of uh, variations and complexity of your models, okay? Um, one further comment, why do we need emission? Astrogam was a mission that was supposed to detect down to MEV or tens of MEVs, okay? Where are most of the blazar sources living? They're living in this part of parameter space, okay? And um, index greater than two, that means the peak is outside the Fermi range. So from the lesson about what happened when we didn't observe the peak of the luminosity uh, in, in uh, stellar mass black holes, whatever results we derive could be highly misleading. And we really want to observe the peak on both sides. So there's a big gap right here. See, there are never any observations. So that's what I would argue we need to worry about in the future. OK, so I'm going maybe too slowly. But just to remind you again, um, when you have a generic double peak source, um, the explanation often involves synchrotron radiation and uh, inverse Compton IC radiation. OK. And uh, why is that? Well, you can take a particle physics book and look at all the cross sections that are there, and you will find that these are the ones with the largest values, in particular Compton uh, scattering and synchrotron <clears throat> radiation. OK. And you can throw in, it's not an emission process, but you can throw in also, uh, you can do crossing symmetries. You can throw in a photon photon pair production. OK. And these, po these processes are also a possible, all right? But because we're dealing with protons that have a much larger mass, uh, like proton synchrotron radiation is reduced, this cross section by MP, the mass of the proton divided by the mass of the electron, maybe one over that, uh, squared. So these cross sections involving hadrons are always much slower. That means they're harder uh, to occur. So if you're looking for the easiest, most efficient things, it's typically these guys, why it, it shows up. And when you have synchrotron radiation, um, you have electrons, uh, the realistic electrons make synchrotron radiation. Even if the source was empty, had no photons initially, you will create photons inside your source. So, um, and those electrons will inevitably must interact with that radiation. So you will always get a peak on this side. If the only photons that your electrons are scattering with are the synchrotron ones that are self-generated by the same electrons, that's called self-synchrotron emission. And if the photons are coming from outside the jet, somewhere else outside your emission region, then that's external inverse Compton EIC emission. And that's what's over here. And what this is showing you is if you could actually measure the spectra and your source was just uh, one zone um, and you can measure the spectrum accurately, what I've done here is I took the synchrotron spectrum between here and here that could be measured by an X ray satellite like Astro H and inverted it to get the underlying electron uh, distribution, okay, and then predicted the inverse Compton emission. And uh, what you do is you can see you can do a very good job of predicting uh, what's going on on this side. And the reason that's relevant is we're going to hear a talk later about um, uh, trying to disentangle or uh, understand what the extragalactic uh, infrared background is. And that's relevant because the gamma rays observed from TV blazars will interact with the extragalactic extra galactic background radiation, OK, and get absorbed. But in order to figure out how much absorption occurred, we need to know something about the underlying model. So we'd like to see what the intrinsic unabsorbed spectrum is. And that's a possible way uh, to do that, if the source were that simple. And we'll see later that it's probably never that simple, but we can always hope, um, it, perhaps during a huge flare or one uh, blob uh, dominates. OK, so um, in order to do what I care at what I just said, you need multi-wavelength observations, all right? Um, OK, so um, now some of the questions that come up that I should be spending maybe more time on, but we've been talked about, where do we get the required GVT electrons? And they could also be electrons and positrons or pions, OK? 
And people talk about bottom-up scenarios where you have acceleration. You take low energy electrons and you bring them up to high energies. So, and we had talks on Fermi acceleration, all right? And the other way to do it is for some reason, um, we accelerated protons somewhere, all right? And then we let them just run down the jet. Eventually, if they hit a wall of uh, photons, okay, somewhere, um, then they can do photo pair produce, whatever. But the point is that I'm not creating the, the leptons, which ultimately do the radiation, even in so-called hadronic models, um, all right? Um, they're, they're not accelerated. They're created at high energies and simply cool. That's called a top-down model. Um, and neutrinos would be a smoking gun for this kind of hadronic model because um, whenever you create pi pluses and pi minuses, um, they give you uh, neutrinos as, uh, and they qu carry quite a big, big energy. The advantage of hadronic models is protons are easier to accelerate to very high energies, just like in a proton synchrotron on Earth um, because of lower mass and lower interaction cross sections. All right, so that's good. So we can get them high energies at disadvantages. Again, eventually, it looks like that some of these jets are very efficient gamma ray producers. Maybe not all the power of the jet, but a significant fraction, 10, 30% could end up in gamma rays. So we have to extract it out. And moreover, the observed gamma ray luminosity, as Luigi mentioned, can vary on time scales as fast as five minutes. Okay, um, that's a problem. How do we extract the energy out? The processes are inefficient and slow. That's so that's led theorists to say, ah, that doesn't work. But we don't really know. Okay, um, generically, if uh, the p gamma uh, photo meson production or uh, photo uh, pair, pair production, but involving a proton. Um, instead of an electron, if that's going on, uh, you'll generally get electromagnetic cascades. So the gamma ray radiation that you produce um, will interact with something, another photon before coming out and it get absorbed and create an electron and a positron and those will cool further by this and then you, you get uh, radiation uh, cascading down. So, and we'll go in a second over there. Um, I'm gonna just quickly uh, go through this. It'll be on the talk, you can look, look at it later. If you've never seen this before, and you're sort of a student, it's good to measure things in terms of uh, dimensionless variables. And uh, there's a thing called a compactness, which is right down here, which is basically the optical depth, in this case, to Thompson scattering, okay? Uh, so here's the size of the source. Here's a number density of uh, electrons in the source. You, you can put in, uh, or photons, okay? You can put whatever you like, and this is a cross section. If we replace this with a number density of target photons, and we replace this with the pair production cross section, gamma gamma goes to electron positron. Um, that has an order of magnitude of 0.2, the Thompson cross section. So forgetting factors of order unity, we can just ignore that. And um, we can run through here and you'll end up with something uh, called the, the compactness. And if a source has this number uh, bigger than one, and uh, if you enter E is the energy of the characteristic target photons divided by MEC squared, uh, if that's bigger than one, then your source is opaque to photon-photon pair production, okay? And gamma ray bursts are famous for having values of this compactness parameter of 10 to the 12, all right? But blazars have caught up uh, significantly and they're also in principle extremely opaque, all right? How do you get around this opacity problem? Okay, one way, the argument I just made to estimate the source density assumes that the gamma rays are traveling through uh, coexistent, um, uh, target photons. So the gamma rays and the target photons are in the same place. If you put them in different places, you have different emission components, this argument falls apart, okay? Another way of avoiding this is to say, aha, look, here's the observed flux, all right? But that's a trick because it's been Doppler boosted. So if I remove the Doppler boosting um, and correct things, um, I will drop, I will decrease the uh, density of photons inside the source. And this has a very strong power, Doppler factor delta to the fifth. So it's actually quite easy to make sources um, transparent uh, to their own radiation. What's not so easy and people get confused with all the time is, um, remember I told you that there's a broadline region that can produce uh, the opaque two gamma rays, right? This over here, it doesn't matter. This is not moving relativistically. This is stationary in the observer frame. So there's no Doppler boost. Nothing can get rid of this, okay? The broadline region cannot be Doppler boosted away. Don't forget that, okay? that opacity. And the fact that um, radiation, that electrons may be cooled catastrophically, um, if the photons are external and stationary in the observer frame, 
There is no Doppler boosting, anything that goes into that. That's a hard concrete um, argument. So um, you can't get rid of the uh, opacity effects uh, that way. Okay. So yeah, you can play down. You can show that you can rewrite everything in nice, simple ways in terms of compactness parameters. So that's a useful thing to do. Um, and yeah. And one thing that's been mentioned before, when you run through all this, the ratio of Compton to synchrotron luminosity, if clandestine effects are not important, is the energy density radiation field to the energy density in the magnetic uh, field. So, um, and um, yeah, the part in the SSC component, luminosity in the SSC component um, scales with this, the square. And that's, uh, if you have an observed radiation flux, that goes to the source side when you correct for it to figure out what's going on in the source, this ratio goes R to the minus two, and this has a Doppler factor in it. And so by adjusting the Doppler factor, you can make, you can change the uh, ratio of the synchrotron to Compton component, okay? And you can make it what you want, but in what's been observed in a lot of sources is that the Compton luminosity is, if it's SSC luminosity, is higher than it ought to be, okay? And that means that you, you can't have, um, uh, it means that basically the source is out of equipartition by a large amount. So that's a problem. Okay. So, right. So we can read through this. What's the acceleration energy spectrum? We don't know. That's what the subjects of the talk talks earlier have been about. All right. And um, one thing that, yeah, is the energy cutoff in some objects, which we're getting better observations with now that we have Fermi and ground-based detectors that are overlapping in coverage, we can start worrying about this. Um, what's, what's causing it, we don't know. Um, Luigi pointed out that we don't see strong breaks in some sources, which is a bit puzzling. That means the emission is either coming from far away from the black hole or another possibility that was briefly mentioned is the um, acceleration and the emission is coming from an extended region, which goes from a region of high opacity to low opacity. And when you do that, it's, uh, and you look in a source, you don't get an exponential cutoff, you get a power law break um, and that could explain what's going on. One other problem that was made, um, a big problem in the 90s was, and when we look at these gamma ray spectra, we'll see that there is a, um, at low energies, low energies mean KV to MeV, there's a hard spectrum, often with a slope of e to the minus 1.5. And then at Fermi range, we saw that most blazers have a spectrum steeper than two. So there's a break. Why is there a break at the energy it is, and why do a lot of, uh, blazar spectra, especially the FSRQs, have spectral indices in the x-rays, uh, hard x-rays of 1.5. And uh, people used to say the break was caused by the transition from efficient to inefficient cooling, the so-called cooling break, but that's quite sensitive to the parameters of the source, and I don't think it can explain what's going on, okay? And we'll talk more about that later, but that's still a puzzle. What determines the break in uh, gamma ray spectra. And the model is the phenomenological model is simply put in a parameter in the electron distribution, gamma B, gamma break, which in some cases is the lowest energy of accelerated electrons. And that's totally put in by hand. Um, I think that we saw some clues to this, like in the talk by Martin Lemoyne, um, that there's a bath of quasi-thermal particles with Lorentz factors of a few hundred. That's good enough to explain what's going on possibly, but that's something still to be worried about. Um, in the interest of time, I really should be stopping soon. Um, I will, um, if you have, when clandestine effects are involved, um, this breaks causes uh, the simple formulas you're used to about to break down, okay? And uh, in particular, when clandestine effects are important, um, a lot of the power no longer goes to inverse Compton scattering because uh, clandestine effects means the Compton scattering cross-section goes down. Um, the synchrotron cross-section can go down too, but only when you're interacting relativistically with the virtual photon magnetic field, which means you can forget about it. So the synchrotron uh, cooling rate is always proportional to gamma squared, but if your electron has a sufficiently high gamma that interacts in the clandestine limit, its cooling rate will decrease. So more and more power ends up in the synchrotron component. And that's what's showing you over here. So you have to be careful about things. Um, when you're dealing with SSC model, okay, um, and you try and increase the power in the source, I keep injecting more and more electrons, you would think that uh, a so-called Compton catastrophe should occur and you get more and more power in uh, the radiation, but you don't because clandestine effects uh, kick in. So, and you end up with a very hard X-ray spectrum. Um, okay, and the luminosity in gamma rays increases only very slightly. 
And this may have been noted in the case of gamma ray bursts, but the uh, AGM people haven't worried about this too much, but it could be important. All right. Um, we, we're, it's time to enter questions, but I, have to, I should go through a couple more things. Um, the trouble just, uh, oops, I wanted to mention about neutrinos, and I'm not going to say anything else about it except for this. Um, there are lots of papers on neutrinos. Neutrinos, again, as I mentioned, come about from proton photon interactions. You make a pion, delta resonance. All right. Uh, the key that's buried in a lot of these things, in my opinion, is, uh, issue is you need to have a threshold. You need to have a high enough uh, electron or proton, sorry, proton energy to make the pion. All right. And this is what you need to interact with the uh, uh, CMB for an ultra energy cosmic ray. All right. But let's consider what happens um, for an uh, ice cube neutrino. Ice cube neutrinos are in the energy range, sort of 1 TeV to PeV. All right. And um, so any proton in principle with more than a TeV energy is good enough to do the job, except that um, the pion doesn't have an arbitrary range of energies. It typically gets to this so called the um, inelasticity. Okay, and you can make something called delta function approximation. It gets 0.1 to 10%, 20% of the energy of the a proton, and the neutrino produced from that has something like a third of the energy. I'm probably messing this up. There's a factors of a couple floating around, but that's irrelevant for the point here. Okay, so if um, ice cube sees neutrinos from 1 TV to 1 PV, and maybe it's because the spectrum often drops, number of spectrum drops with energy, maybe it's mostly seeing TV neutrinos. So to make a TV neutrino, we we'll run through this argument, we need a 20 TV proton, all right? And so that proton is going to have an Lorentz factor of 10 to the four. I stick it into this formula and I'm no longer solving for gamma over here. I'm gonna solve for E to the energy of the target photon. That means I need a target photon of 3.5 KB. I need to interact with X-rays, okay? And I need to act, interact with a lot of them for efficient production energy losses and things like that. But where do you get these? This is not obvious. The accretion disk by itself does, uh, is, has a peak luminosity in the ult optical ultraviolet, right? Um, in the AGN standard model, the X-rays are coming from the corona, which is very close to the black hole. And if you're very close to the black hole, you have a very large pair production optical depth. So that's why possibly when people run these elaborate calculations, uh, you can't explain the Fermi spectrum uh, with the particles that are doing the neutrino production. And that's fine if we have multiple components in different regions doing things, that's good. But the connection between gamma rays and, um, and uh, neutrinos isn't obvious, okay? You have to be careful about it, okay? And um, I don't see a way around this. So um, if you have high energy particles, um, yeah, you will make high energy neutrinos and maybe most neutrinos that ice cube sees are PV neutrinos, then you can get away with optical UV photons, which are much more plentiful, and that's fine, but then we're in a, in a different regime. Okay, that, so that's what we need to worry about for ice cube neutrinos. Um, some other twists on models that have been seen, uh, talked about, um, is that jets could be stratified, okay? People like to take blobs moving with a down a jet with a fixed Lorentz factor, but maybe the jet is different fluid flows moving with different Doppler speeds, okay? And people talk about stratified or structured jets, all right? And uh, what that means is if the, there's fluid going down here, it's gonna, they're gonna have different beaming patterns. In particular, radiation from here, uh, if it's moving more slowly, could leak into the center of the jet. And buzzwords that you may have heard is a sheath spine jet geometry. So you have a fast moving component surrounded by a slower moving uh, component. And oftentimes, when you look at FR1s in particular, you see limb brightening. Um, the edges of the jet are much brighter than the center sometimes. So that's over here. Um, when you talk about where could acceleration be occurring, there, is several, there are several papers saying that the acceleration could be occurring in the sheath, which is a boundary layer, basically. Here's matter not in the jet, and here's relativistically moving matter in the jet. Uh-oh, oh dear. Let's hope this stops. That's the problem with being home. Um, um, Okay, so that's a site of particle acceleration. So, um, and what could happen is you get a photons from the sheath impacting here, and that could cause uh, inverse Compton emission and cooling. So we called it a ring of fire, all right? And um, also, um, what I mentioned previously was the jet itself could emit things, and maybe the emission uh, pattern angle is larger than the side of the jet. And so photons from the spine could hit somewhere on the outside or a broadline region and then come back 
and uh, impact the jet or some other blob going later. That's a sort of called a Compton mirror. Emission from the jet goes out here, does something, gets absorbed, and then comes back and causes a flare. And we'll see an example of that in a second. Um, and um, why is this relevant? There's a phenomenon called orphan flares, where the apparently the Compton component flares up and, uh, and does dramatic things, and nothing happens in the synchrotron component. And so in the language that Luigi talked about, the Compton dominance goes up. So you need to, in order to do that with the same blob, you need to increase the radiation field tremendously. So maybe there's a special zone uh, like due to some stationary shock out here that could cause that. So that's what the point of this paper is out. All right. So this is a very old thing from 2009. We're, we're still arguing about all these. Okay, what's the emission mechanism? What's the uh, location of the mechanism? What are the particle acceleration mechanisms? What's the jet made out of? Um, pointing flux, oops, is it leptonic ions? Okay. Um, and I think people are converging that by the time the jet gets to the end, it's energetically dominated by protons or ions, but you could still have uh, the number by number, uh, electrons and positrons dominating, okay? But um, because electrons and positrons have one two thousandth the ma mass of a proton, okay, even if they dominate by number, when you actually compute the total rest mass energy, everything, the protons could dominate, okay? Um, but that's an ongoing question. What's confining the jet, all right? What's the accretion this black hole jet connection? And uh, all these things, uh, unfortunately, are still open questions, all right? And in the remaining, non-remaining time, I just want to show you um, some more sort of observational results that um, uh, show you some of the complications that we have to deal with. So here's a beautiful spectrum from our Karen 421, again, a long, long time ago, but um, quasi-simultaneous. And this source doesn't seem to be doing too much. And uh, if I were a theorist, I would fit everything from here to here. And using a synchrotron self-Compton model, and you'll get a beautiful fit, and it would be a complete waste of time because when you observe with radio, you can tell that uh, things are varying in different manners over here. There's different blobs are responsible for this. So it's an accident that it looks so nice and smooth. So just because you can fit it with a one-zone model doesn't mean that that's what you should be doing, all right? Um, here's This is always fun to show. Here's a one-zone model, uh, the one I worked on, but other people are the equivalent. If things really were a one zone model, if there are nice predictable patterns, here we're injecting particles of high energy and let them cool down. You can see these cooling waves and their lags, if you measure it between the gamma rays and the X-rays, because um, in order, this is a synchrotron self Compton model. So to produce the gamma rays, first you have to have synchrotron radiation and you have to build up the intensity inside the source before you see uh, uh, response over here. So there's a light crossing time delay over here. All right, so that's cool. And if we could observe this, um, which requires lots of multi-wavelength data with very good time resolution, which is the, one of the last things I'm gonna talk about, um, you could do that. But unfortunately, um, it's probably, this is the case of a spherical cow that's not doing a very good job of explaining what's going on. And um, a Markarian 501 has dramatic stuff. Remember the previous plot I showed you? Uh, wasn't the th source wasn't doing much on two month time scales. Now it's going crazy on hour time scales with huge uh, variations. And what you see here is um, the X rays don't seem to be doing much, but uh, whoops, but the TVs are flaring the Mercury 421. And every time there's a TV flare, there's actually a little X ray blip. So that would argue that the X rays are diluted. There's a slowly varying component. And then the gamma ray emitting region actually does emit some gamma rays and they can briefly dominate. Okay, so multiple components. And here's an example of an orphan flare where I'm supposed to fit everything with SSC model. So these are exactly, exactly, exactly simultaneous observations. And um, you will find a case where there was a gamma ray flare and nothing was going on in the X-rays, all right? And so this is showing a correlation uh, between X-ray luminosity and TV flux. There is a pretty good correlation, which interestingly, in the case of Mercari in 501 during its big flaring episode in 1997, persisted for half a year, which is impossible if you have a blob moving uh, relativistically. So what happened in Mercari in 501 was not just one blob. It's maybe some stationary feature in the jet. And one further comment is if you're trying to do relativistic corrections and your emitting region is stationary in the jet, your Doppler correction factors are different, okay? So this is the gamma ray flare that lies way off the correlation, okay? So what you really need to do to study these objects has very good time-resolved um, observations. 
which we don't have quite yet. Okay, then you can look for things like hysteresis plots, which is um, uh, the source bearing when you compare spectral index and two different energy bands. You can see characteristic patterns like this, um, which is good in this case, but um, it's we don't have the equivalent data. All right, and so just to show that they're fun missed components, Markarian 501 is a boring source and and was a boring source in the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory and also Fermi. Not so much is happening here, but you can have dramatic variations in the high energy component. And here we have examples of this. See the blue points are always kind of the same, and maybe even the source went into an off state here in in VEG gamma rays. But there's always some gamma ray uh, GV flux. It doesn't vary by that much. So you really need to know what's going on with that, okay? And what could be happening just for fun? Uh, this is an old model of Christmas tree, internal tree shock model, um, where lots of different zones are going off and that might well explain what happens. And here's a new observation uh, for where to go. Uh, and 3C264, an object that is maybe like um, M87, okay? And you, what you can see is blobs moving and uh, they hit each other in brightness. So these are two blobs catching up to each other. So that might happen in real life. So these are just example of real life complications that you need to deal with. All right. Um, this is a huge flare in 3C454.3, but in this state over here, the source showed absolutely zero gamma ray variability. Okay. And interestingly, if you look in the optical and uh, near infrared, there's a massive flare, okay, not seen in gamma rays. So this is an orphan flare in the synchrotron component, supposedly, that's not reflected in gamma rays. And curiously, you have a huge gamma ray outburst not so long later. So maybe this is an example of a Compton mirror or something smashing, setting off a UV flare that comes back and hits the jet somewhere else. And that's what's going on there. But that's an example of uh, the complications we're talking about. And the only thing you need to see over here is this is 3C454 uh, as a function of different times. And here's an observation, this one and this one, all right? Uh, it's well known that uh, 454.3 has very strong Compton dominance. So in this flare episode, it was sort of the apparent luminosity is 10 to 49 eggs per second. In the gamma ray component in here, it's 10 to 48. So Compton dominance of uh, gamma ray luminosity to, to synchrotron luminosity 10 to 100 in some cases. Okay. In this case, whoops, the synchrotron looks like it's higher than the inverse Compton component, which is not supposed to happen. So um, all right, and at various times also, um, here's a spectrum. Where's the peak for this famous GV peak source? It's actually at MEV energies. So this source switched to be an MEV blazer and also the Compton dominance went away apparently. So how we explain that, we don't know. Um, and uh, there are other cool things. Uh, you can plot the correlation between gamma ray flux and, and uh, optical flux. And I'm on a paper that says that there's a great linear correlation, but in these individual flares, it's not. That's linear correlation. This is a quadratic correlation that you expect from a synchrotron self Compton model. This is a cubic correlation. And the source does everything it wants. The only thing that's different is when the source is a different flare, it seems to persist in a state. So when it's in a certain state, it does lie in a certain correlation, all right? But it switches between different states. So a takeaway is, that these objects are not stationary. They're not sitting on the graduate school, uh, graduate student lifetime. They're not sitting in the same state. And you need to take that into account when you derive uh, average properties. So yeah, there's lots of data. So this is 2155. It seems to lie on the cubic branch. OK, um, fine. So, um, so there are lots of things uh, going on. And the point is, OK, I'm going to stop, I promise, um, that there's very fast uh, variability in a lot of Fermi sources. And this has not been resolved, and it's on time scales faster than a day, um, which is not what people typically uh, study. All right. And if you look at this plot over here, the black dots are gamma ray flux points on six hour time scales are going up and down by factors of two. This is the optical, and it seems to be decaying smoothly with no intranight variability at all. Okay. And a similar example of this this is the optical in a different flare, 454.3. And the optical is bearing, maybe there's a bit of action over here, but not very much. It's very slow, all right? And as I go over here, um, this is now resolved on three hour time scales. There's all sorts of that variability in the gamma rays that's not seen in the optical. Yet, okay, if I were to average everything, there's a great correlation between gamma rays and optical on sort of day to week time scales, but not on sub day time scales. 
So how the source manages to do that is not obvious and something we need to think about. But before we do that, we have to get good time resolved spectra. So this is just showing you again that a lot of uh, flares that we think we resolved when you actually break them down and Ari Burl who's on the talk has been doing this. Um, these flares actually have sub flares inside them. And if I don't understand the sub flares, I have to be very careful how I interpret things uh, based on that. Okay, so the only takeaway point from this part of the talk is that uh, we really have to don't use daily bins, okay? And um, <clears throat> rapid variability is a problem, not just for TV blazers, but for GV blazers. And I'm gonna stop, let's, yeah. Here's some complications in modeling. And the only takeaway from this, that if I had more time it was, uh, Svi made a point, don't do chi by i and make sure that you, your model actually goes through real data points. And um, this is a paper that said, I can explain all the variation in this object by just changing the gamma ray luminosity. And we have really good data points on the synchrotron component and that doesn't explain what's going on. So, so actually theory should actually pay attention to the data if possible. All right, and I think with that, I'm going to stop, okay? Um, and we can discuss details about individual things. And what's probably happening, okay, it's a complicated model with multiple emission regions. And this is for fun, all right? If you're looking for the acceleration people, we don't really know what's going on in acceleration, which is why I left it blank like that. This is a picture that people will throw there, but um, it's clearly more complicated than that with different emission regions. So I'll stop with that. Okay. These are various words that maybe some experts might want to talk about from a talk summary talk I gave 10 years ago and the question of these still issues that we're talking about. So um, I've run way over, so I'm going to stop right now. And uh, if we've got questions or things that we want to discuss that I went way too fast over, um, let's bring them up. Okay, so I will stop talking, I promise, at this point. Okay. Thank you, Paolo. That was really great. There's a lot of lot of material to digest. We we need to we need to have two talks. Two. Yeah, I know. All right. We'll, we'll put it in the talk. <laughs> well, thanks for the, right. for the really nice summary. Um, uh, Felix, why don't you take this? Uh, we, uh, okay. So I guess we should go directly to discussion, and um, sorry to be mixed with questions. Um, may I start, Paolo? Just one question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, you were just over US from 90s to these days, and there are a lot of questions. Could you name at least one direction in the blazer studies <laughs> in which we could say is a significant progress since 90s? Um, it, it's, not, it's not sarcastic, it's just really it's interesting. Because it's 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 very heavy area. Yep. Many problems, but uh, difficult to say that we have a progress, right? Yeah, I, I, I think. I think we're confused at a higher level. It's a bit, little bit like Eugene Parker once said about the sun. Well, we can't model anything. We can't predict the exact spectral lines, but we know what doesn't work now <laughs> at some level. For example, we're pretty sure we have multiple emission components and, um, and we have very rapid time variability. With egret, for example, we had hints of that, but now we know that. And then we have the TV and the fact that, for example, flat spectrum radio quasars have been detected, a few of them as VHE sources is a problem because of the broadline region argument I made. So, so we know that these objects are more complicated than in the past which is not a positive answer, but it means we can't use these simple one zone models. And we have to think about different emission regions and we have uh, very fast sort of acceleration and or cooling times. That's, which wasn't so obvious 10 years ago. So the, the problems have gotten worse and the simulations have gotten better, but there may not be good enough because they don't span the whole range. And uh, what it means is the tools also from the observational side that we use to analyze things have to be more sophisticated. Uh, for example, people use uh, discrete correlation functions to measure the lag between high energies and low energies. But underlying the assumption of a discrete correlation function is it gives us a statistical stationary process. So all your data, the same thing is going on all the time. But if your object goes through different states, it's the, the whole source can change its character completely. And um, we need to take that into account. None of this, 
is positive, okay? But um, we're getting better. That's that's what Rashmi asked me once. Okay, I've got all this gamma ray data. What do I do with it? And um, I think that if we put it together more carefully, um, we, we'll we'll get something out of it. Um, the fact that there are states like people are now um, Tevekian, some other people are talking about. It's a there's some governing large envelope, and then there's some stochastic model in between. Uh, the central engine maybe controls what's happening overall in the jet, and then you can have fast variations inside that. Um, in order to do anything with that, we need to acquire lots of statistics. And the number of bright AGN that you can measure fully resolve the time variability um, is of order 10 in Fermi. That's not a very large sample. And maybe there are 30 flares that you can study all together. So that's not so great. Um, and you need multi-wave observations. So our data has gotten much better, but it's not good enough yet, I guess. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, what, what, what could be the reason for the slow progress? Um, I mean, um, slow progress. So if, if, if to be really a bit, it, it may be nasty is the question. Yep. We don't see anywhere real progress, right? So even in theory, not theory, even modeling, I think, I mean, what, what has been done like by Sikora, Ghiselini or others is uh, Masticadis, so could name some more names yourself, but now the mo even modeling is not much, much, much uh, uh, progressed. I mean, that is also then. Yep, and part of that is we need to understand the sort of source parameters and if you have multiple emission regions in a jet, um, you have to fit them in different ways. And we don't have good constraints to nail down the parameters. Where I do think there have been pr progress is actually uh, sort of some of these talks, this, the acceleration simulations have gotten a lot better than before. They have much higher resolution. Um, like, okay, you can only measure a few skin depths with PIC simulations, but it's getting better. I think we're in a better place than we used to be also. Um, in the 90s, we were just starting out to be able to do GRMHD simulations. Those are in much better shape than before. Um, now, does, does a GRMHD simulation have enough plasma physics in it to predict the emission spectrum and acceleration? No, but we're, we're in a much better place than beforehand. We can actually simulate like the M87 jet. We can go out in, in larger scales. So, um, but here, maybe someone else in the audience has an opinion. That's I, I'm going to discuss some of these issues next time. Okay, great. Yeah. So, I, I mean, may I? So, uh, I'll give you. Just, uh, uh, I, I apologize. I don't find the raise hand for some reason. Ah, uh, no, there are two. But okay, then go ahead. Go ahead. We will ask them. Uh, I, I just want to make a quick comment that you know all these phenomenological models make assumption about microphysics. Just as an example. Um, there, there is a recent paper or papers by Sobachi and co colleagues uh, that point out that, you know, if, uh, if you assume that dissipation occurs through relativistic turbulence, then you expect the pitch angle distribution to be non-isotropic. For example, that can suppress a synchrotron emission, you know, and you get Compton dominance and can do all kinds of things. So I think this, is, this might be one of the problems is that, you know, we are using, uh, very naive or very basic uh, emission models based on on some assumptions that are not necessarily correct. And I think, as Paolo pointed out, that with uh, with the more, what people call modern approach, you know, trying to study this using uh, peak simulation and other things, we, we might have uh, uh, better information in the near future. The, the, the main problem is that these systems are a multi-scale system. There is an enormous scale separation and, and that's the great challenge here. Anyway, I'll stop here. Okay, the next time you will maybe address this in <laughs> detail. So let's I'm go not with... gonna offer any, any film solution, but I'm gonna uh, show some progress and, and discuss the challenges in, in you know, sort of detailed modeling of this beyond the phenomenological approach that will be my attempt. Okay, thanks. So we go to, there are two questions. So Helen, Helen Zoll, Helen, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, for me, if I can uh, answer to the question by uh, Felix, 
there was a very big progress on the in the understanding of the inner boundary condition of the AGA and geyser physics, because now we know that uh, black holes ex do exist and, and that they are at the heart of all, this, all, the, all the question, in fact. So uh, and one can see now beautiful uh, MHD of general relativistic peak simulation of black hole magnetosphere. And of course, there is, a, there is still a, a very long path to link that to the jet physics and, and so on, but there is really a very big uh, um, um, qualitative step which has been achieved, I would say, during the last uh, decade. So anyway, that's my my feeling, but uh, okay, I, I don't know. There is still a, a very long way to, to to link all what happened in the black hole magnetosphere with the blazar physics in, in, the, in the nuclear jet and so on. Uh, I, I had a question to uh, Paolo concerning what you said for top-down scenario. Um, because uh, you say, okay, we just need to create uh, hadrons or protons at the, the desired uh, energy then. But you need first to have already uh, highly energetic massive particles to achieve yes. yep. that. So, so in fact, at the end, it is again a bottom-up uh, process, no? To generate, to have these highly energetic massive particles. Yep. Or do you have thing... another way? Right, that's correct. So the only difference could be that it, it's easier to accelerate protons. So you worry about that and don't worry about accelerating the electrons. And then if you can transfer them to a region where they can lose their energy. Um, so it, there's still an acceleration problem, but maybe if you split it into a dissipation region or a cooling region and an acceleration region, you can do an easier job of accelerating. Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. So, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. um, okay so uh, next question, uh, Yevgeny Derishev. Genial. Uh, yes, Felix. Uh, I, if I'm not uh, uh, <laughs> if I'm not too modest, I, I would uh, like first uh, answer to your comment. Uh, you said that nothing was uh, in the field during many past years, but uh, answer, answer <laughs> there is a bare bounds <laughs> model which yeah. which, which is uh, which is in fact consistent and answers at least uh, the qualitative questions. So maybe uh, maybe it's something uh, that that can be considered. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, two questions uh, to Paolo. Uh, thank you, by, by the way, for very good talk. Uh, one question is: uh, you somewhere in the middle, you compare the power of the jet to the power in the lobes, yeah. and you said that the jet uh, uh, has to be uh, not too efficient because there is a lot of power in the lobes. Yeah. But on, on the other hand, the lobes are, you know, that they, are, uh, they represent average over many millions of years, yep. while the jet is just the current state of the blazer. So how can we, how can we be sure that uh, the efficiency is indeed not so high? Um, no, and so, okay, so, so you might be right um, about that. In that an individual flare, maybe you decelerated the whole jet. Um, but um, you, you, so I didn't show, but we now have like 11 years of Fermi observations, for example. And um, the duty cycle of flaring is maybe 10 ish percent. It's enough that we've, we, for a lot of sources, we're now trying to, where we can see um, a fair sample of the states. So you can drive an average gamma ray luminosity, which actually might mean something. Maybe it's not converged yet, the average, but that average is still pretty high for these objects. And, and so you can compare that. So look, you're right, there are duty cycle arguments and in individual flares, the jet may die, but there's clearly something going down the end that's, that's powerful. So yeah, individually, I can't do that to the extent it's, it's transient, but um, also when you go down in the radio, um, you can estimate jet kinetic power there and the time scales there now become thousands of years at kiloparsecs and there's still a lot of energy there. So um, 
the, there's so, so what's the what's the mean relative efficiency then that you get what, what is the mean if, if you know if you average over uh, you say okay so there's mean? like uh Gabriela easily could answer that better but i'd be guessing 20 percent 30 percent i i don't know really the answer myself yeah I think it has oh, to be pretty oh. high, but not. Uh, 30 percent is, is still way high, isn't it's it? Very high. Yeah. yeah. So, so this could be an exercise that we could test. Um, yep. But I think it oh, can't okay. be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but some of the apparent luminosities are like ten to forty nine ergs per second. I mean that's that's so that's very big. I think the average will drop by a factor of ten maybe. So ten to forty eight. But it it's still. So then there's also the Doppler factor that you can put yeah. in. In some jets, the Doppler factors have gotten higher as you go with higher frequency radio observations you can see inside. Like Alan Marshall now talks about 30 or 40 and that will also change all the efficiency factors. So you're right. Uh, this is a good question we could think about probably. And then the second question, which is uh, in fact related, uh, you, you seem to prefer in, to, some, uh, to some extent, at least this is my impression, uh, some kind of uh, intrinsically, essentially, uh, non-stationary models uh, as opposed to quasi-stationary models of emission. And this, uh, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, this implies that the emission is not efficient. Um, I don't, well, yeah. So what I was implying, okay, you can tell me why, was that there are just different regions with different physical parameters. So one region is a different variability time scale and a different Compton UB over URAD. And so, so you will see one thing's when one region dominates and then the other one, you'll, they'll switch and see something else. And while you're inside any one given region dominating, it'll, it'll look quasi stationary, but is that different from what you're saying? And if you mix two different processes from two different regions, then you'll get a kind of a mess if you're not careful. That's what I was trying to say. Is that contradictory to what you're saying or? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that we are talking exactly about the same thing. What I'm trying to say, um, imagine you have something which is radiatively efficient, then if you inject particles somehow, they will start to radiate and the radiation, because it's radiatively efficient, the radiation should happen very quickly. And therefore you expect a kind of quasi-stationary solution which may evolve in time because uh, the parameters um, but not not be, but not because the source itself evolves ki kinetic distribution yeah. as, as a response to injection. Uh, on the other hand, you oh, you may build up a kind of uh, intrinsically uh, unsta not stationary model where you change uh, the particle injection and then you see how uh, uh, what's what's the response of the distribution to this change in the injection. But this yeah. is probably not possible if, if the emission is efficient, quick. Yeah, so Alan Marcher has like a, a little kind of Christmas tree model or something, yeah. Um, you're right, so you're right in that you have many small emission regions, uh, but, um, and so there are the jet and jet models, mini jet models where um, the way you get around that, which is slightly artificial is you have a very high temporary Doppler factor, like you have some reconnection going on in some, some bulk flow, and temporarily you have particles going much faster, and then um, they go away. But you're right, that, that's an, an efficiency problem, which is also for gamma ray bursts. If there's too much power in any one event, that's not obvious how you do that. But um, I think if I have fast cooling times, if I have different regions with fast cooling times with different parameters, and I light them up randomly, which is what some people do with turbulent models, then I can arrange flickering, okay? But what is not so hard to, not so easy to arrange is to have very high amplitude flickering or non-stationarity. Maybe that's the right parameter to use, whether the model is linear or non-linear, people talk about. Like what's the probability that I get a factor 10 flare? And if I have lots of different regions, which I appear to need because I see things going up and down, then they mm. tend to average out and then, mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see. I, I, can mention, I can mention our paper with Ron Krieger and Eva Leffer about multi-blob multi model when you have average 
all 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 they emit but if someone gets very small angle so doppler uh, doppler factor increases even slightly but then you have dramatic in, uh, enhancement of flux so you you think this is a flare on uh, and then on our ears there are many many blobs which all contribute and time to time one becomes leading one just because of the Doctor, a small angle, even even less complicated, even no any reconnection, just for some reason, angles become smaller and then immediately get this effect. So, um, okay. I have a quick question, maybe in yeah. the last one minute. So it's like, you had a slide Paolo, with yep. small trouble with AGN jets <laughs> and neutrinos, I think. Yeah. So um, so maybe I made a mistake there, but yeah. Um, let's see. I mean, I, I was just wondering, I mean, I guess what is the, ah, okay, what we happened? don't have much data yet. No. What's the, what can you say about neutrinos and in AGN jets? Yeah, I think um, that was this one. Yeah, I mean, I guess what Felix said is we only have one neutrino firmly or that could come from there. I mean, to be slightly fair, Ice Cube, I guess they claimed they detected 27 neutrinos at an earlier time, maybe. There was a flare, but we don't have that large a sample. So I mean, the question is, what should we be looking for? I mean, I guess bigger detectors, better detectors, and all that. I guess. But what can yeah. we do now with what we have? Is the question. If there's um, evidence, some evidence of neutrinos and laser flares and X-rays. Yep. Um. Yeah, the, so the question might be, again, these multiple emission components. Um, so maybe like looking for an X-ray flare might be better or something like that. Uh, but the, the new, if what I said was true, the, the gamma rays maybe that come along with the process may be highly masked and not so obvious. So that makes the problem hard again because we don't know what to, to mix and match anymore. Um, yeah. Um, so if there's cascading, okay, eventually the energy has to leak out somewhere. So, um, and if we have different emission components, like they come and go. So I could imagine if you had a long enough time train, you could see where one component uh, sneaks up over another one. Or for example, when I have a big neutrino flare, okay. I have lots of protons, a lot of cascade radiation. So the MEV flux comes up. So if I had an MEV detector and Fermi detector, I could look for MEV periods of MEV flaring. But that presumes that I have a long continuous data train to watch different states. Oops, sorry. Um, I don't have any other, oh, I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay. I don't have any other um, great thought about that. I guess everybody would like to know that. The obvious thing is to look for coincident flaring but what my point is, there are reasons why it may not work that way, or, or the, the neutrinos will be, the gamma rays that are produced, the electromagnetic signature may be confused and hidden in that case, which is another negative kind of comment. But does anybody out there have thoughts about that? There are some neutrino people there. I, I don't think there are many neutrino people here. Well, we're almost out of time. Yeah. But probably we should get yep. <laughs> one, one talk on that because yep. it's a really interesting issue. I mean, a bit in my view, it's very unusual in the community when we have one event or two, and then you know that you look at the sky, you already could find a blazer AGN, and you know that it's very, very difficult to get detectable neutrinos. And at the same time, we put so much emphasis on this single source or single event, knowing that it's very, very difficult to explain. And then it's, uh, well, this question of the taste, should we go? At the same time, it was so, such a beautiful data. I mean, variability, spectrum, we still could not understand. But, well, that is the question of the taste. Maybe you, we should invite all, oh, there, there's a, I think sub community of this sub neutrino aging community, and then invite one of them and to 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 
to get to answer. I think Paolo is not the best person to answer to that question in the sense because he's a bit more conservative and then uh, knows maybe more about the problems. <laughs> um, Paolo, may I still, is very, uh, we don't have much time, but I have still one question. Um, I think uh, Luigi tried to address this last time. It's the peak, synchrotron peak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we call you an extreme, extreme uh, synchrotron AGN. I think it comes <clears throat> from Bellini. You still are talking about the X-rays or hard yep. X-rays, right? Yep. If you correct this peak for, um, if you correct this peak for the Doppler factor, you get 10, even 10 times less. And yep. the, the same time we know the measure of the efficiency of acceleration electrons measure, I mean, individual electrons is about 100 MeV in the rest frame. So in the, in the typical Doppler factor, tennis even goes to GV. And instead of GV peak, we have, um, like in the crab, in the rest is 10 MeV, and we have even even infrared. I mean, if you take these, the, the big ones like 3C 279, it just really goes to infrared region. So how to explain this controversy? I mean, okay, it's not controversy. You may say uh, if uh, the acceleration is very effective in the sense of the total trans transformation of available energy, but is not very effective in the sense of acceleration of individual particles. But these efficiencies looks extremely low. I mean, yeah. many orders of magnitude. Uh, how, how, how you think you could uh, address yeah. this puzzle? Well, I, I'm not sure, maybe a CLUDA is like the variability, there doesn't seem to be fast variability, so maybe it's somewhere far away from the central engine. Uh, and that's- but I mean, your, your statement yeah. is model dependent. It's not that you measure directly the Doppler factor and the efficiency. That's what comes out of from modeling, right? Yes, but I mean- So, so you, that's what my point earlier. I mean, you, you are using some, you know, you are doing some assumption about the microphysics and about, you know, which I mean, but let's don't go to uh, don't go to the details. Nevertheless, if you have <laughs> very effective uh, no, no, but that is a not details. It's orders of magnitude. I mean, you 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 accelerate effectively particle electron, and you get the peak of synchrotron uh, the energy, which is many orders of magnitude below the one you'd expect for extreme accelerator. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, certainly there could be solutions. But um, but but that is interesting point, which is no one, uh, uh, only a few people, uh, I mean, take it seriously. Uh, one thing is just modeling. You assume the power law of exponential cutoff, you assume uh, the cutoff, you assume magnetic field, and they feed data. So that is a bit, uh, but if you ask question, why is peak so, so, so low? Uh, you see, for example, in AGN, uh, in GRBs, we are talking that it this could go to GV energy, so it is extreme mm -hmm. accelerator to kind of so the but but here is we 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 have a just um, it's <laughs> I agree with you just to go details, but if we deal with the orders of magnitude, should be a straightforward answer. Yeah, but what if it's what uh, like Martin Lemann said. You, you, you make a power law acceleration and the cutoff might be very high energy, but most of the particles are in the injection region, whatever, they're moderately relativistic. So you, you tend to heat the plasma and then you have a non-thermal tail, but if the heating's strong enough that gets you to a mean energy like 100 MeV, and, then, and, and you don't have lower energy particles because they get heated up and then you throw them somewhere that might do it, and so it's actually a very non-extreme accelerator, but it's maybe what you get from these simulations that people are doing. Like it, the simulation. it, it is extreme in opposite uh, side. I mean, extremely inefficient. Yeah. yeah. Or it's a mostly thermal sort of exchange accelerator with a few outlier events, perhaps. 
so it's a Fermi process that doesn't actually accelerate you very far. It, it moves all the particles like a bit for this hybrid Comptonization model. And then there's a tail that goes to high energy, which may be what the trunk of guys measure, but Fermi is measuring this lower quasi-thermal bath. And so, yeah, it's not an extreme accelerator at all. Yeah. Um, all, we are, all, all we are missing the real peak, synchrotron peak. Yeah. Somewhere in the GV part. Right. Yep. And it would be buried under, right. Um, yeah. So how it does that. Yeah, it doesn't look that way because it, it looks like you see two components in the synchrotron one cutting off. So, um, yep. There, there could be extreme events. That's what's so bad about it. there could be multiple regions. Most of the time it's not an extreme accelerator. Maybe there are a few ones that are, or some of the orphan flares could be extreme acceleration events also. I don't, yeah. And so that's where maybe some progress in particle acceleration could help. I think that the average Fermi blazer is not exciting at all. You just need a particles with a Lorentz factor of 300. That's it. So to explain everything. So that's boring compared to what you do. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that, that. Okay, so Reshmi, we should conclude, right? Yes, I, I, I sent a note on the chat. Thanks for everyone for staying. And this was great, Paolo. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thanks for coming. To have you back uh, another time. Um, and please, in, in two weeks, please join us um, for, the next, uh, for the next talk by Amir uh, Levinson on um, AGN jets and magnetosphere. Um, so thank you everyone and see you in two weeks.